G'day, my name's Craig Castry from Medible Gardens and I'm here with Melton City Council Learning Directory. This is part two of Edible Gardens and Sustainability. I'm the author of Edible Gardens, A Practical Guide, and uh, I wrote this book a few years ago to give people uh, a practical guide to be able to do what I'm doing. Uh, it's local knowledge, and uh, it is exactly that, a guide to be able to um, set yourself up on a small, large, makes no difference what size block. It has uh, lists of all sorts of companion plants and all the things that you need to, to, uh, to get uh, your garden to become as productive as it possibly can. Um, it's available on my website, www.craigcastry.com.au. Now the presentation that I, uh, I, I did beforehand was talking about utilising space wisely and I want to move into some fruit trees. Um, fruit trees can be a, a rock and a hard place um, in backyards and front yards and I think a lot of people are a bit scared of the fact that they become invasive, they, uh, they lift up paths, they, they can sometimes get into drains or into foundations and I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. Uh, this day and age most fruit trees are on dwarfing rootstocks which means that they don't have a tap root and they aren't any longer invasive. They once were, but they're not now. Um, and nurseries these days stock a wide range of um, plants, uh, trees, that, that will suit your needs without any problem at all. So it's a case of trying to find space. And I think that most people this day and age are on small blocks, uh, nothing like we once were. And it, it is a bit difficult sometimes to find space to, to grow a fruit tree. So this that I've got in front of you here is an apple tree and it's called an espalier. Um, an espalier is a French term for uh, this tree grown two-dimensionally on a frame. So what I've done is I've actually come back uh, off the fence by around about uh, 450 mils, or about 18 inches in the old scale, and I've put a stake either side um, in the ground, and I've put a, a, a timber, uh, timber piece on the top of it, about three metres wide um, and I plant the tree in the middle and about knee height is where I put the first wire in and the wire doesn't necessarily need to be really really strong it just needs to be able to train the supple branches of the the young branches as you as they grow out and you train them up along the wires and when they hit the post either side you cut them off anything that grows toward you and won't grow on the wire you cut off Anything that grows toward the fence, you cut off. See, a lot of people look at this and think that looks really, really hard. But believe me, it's really, really easy in comparison to growing a wine glass shaped fruit tree out in the middle of a backyard uh, where most people scratch their head and are finding it difficult to know where to prune. This, because of the constraints that you have, makes this very, very easy. So let me go over that again. Um, tree in the middle of a three metre uh, stake a top on the top of it so that the stakes don't get pulled in. Knee height is where you put in your first wire, about uh, 30 centimetres up each wire. Doesn't need to be strained, it doesn't need turn buckles or any of that sort of thing, just reasonably tight wire. Um, and you simply train those branches along when they hit the stake, cut them off. Anything that grows toward you, cut off. Anything that grows toward the fence, cut off. Now if you get some branches that come up off these, these lateral branches, and bear in mind, Lateral branches produce more fruit than anything that is vertical. So all those vertical ones that come off the top of this, what you do is you count up four buds and cut those off as they grow. And you can do that all year. And what I've done here to save a bit of space is I've actually grafted, which is tree surgery, um, some different varieties on this tree. And this has actually now got 12 varieties on it. So I actually get... Um, six months worth of picking apples off this one tree. So what I've done is I've put in early, mid and late varieties and everything in between. So the first one I start to pick is Arcane, which is a beautiful red Japanese apple. And the last one to pick is the Granny Smith, which I'll be picking um, probably mid-June to early July. So and this Arcane gets picked in January. So all of these other ones that I get, I pick uh, about 20 to 25 apples off each branch, so I never get a glut of apples. Whereas if you just have one single apple tree in your backyard, 
Uh, you, when it fruits, you're generally going to get about 250 to 300 apples and they're all at once and they're all the same variety. So what do you do with that amount of apples? I mean, it's one thing to make a little bit of apple sauce and apple pie, but you know, two or 300 apples quite often is uh, a, a bit much. And the other thing too is that um, growing these espalier trees is, is a great way of being able to to net them because in my book, no nets equals no fruit. If you've got trees that are taller than you can stand, you can reach standing flat footed as high as you can reach, you're in some trouble because you can't easily throw nets over them. Whereas I keep these trees only as high as the fence. And in my case, my fences are a little higher than others. This is 2.1 metres high. But I've put some screws in top of the fence and I clip the net to the top and then I drape it over the fr front of the frame and I put some tent pegs in the ground and it's game over for the birds. Whereas if you've got trees that are taller than that, um, particularly something maybe a bit like this, very, very difficult to throw a net over, uh, particularly when they start to get out of that range of being, uh, you know, hands up high, as high as you can stand flat footed, reaching as high as you can. And that's, to be honest, about as high as you should ever let your fruit trees get. If you by chance have got fruit trees at home that are much, much higher than that, you can prune them uh, a third now. Um, and I would leave winter alone because when you prune things in winter, it only encourages more growth in the spring. Uh, you could prune them again at the end of summer and again at the end of, of uh, autumn and no winter or, or uh, spring pruning. So that'll get them back down into uh, a, a range that you'll be able to easily net. But this is what I was alluding to before. If you've got these sorts of shaped trees, either in your front yard or backyard, when someone hands you a pair of secateurs to go out there and prune, you, uh, most people are scratching their heads about where to prune, uh, which, look, I mean, they're not as easy as uh, the spader, I don't believe. And if you are scratching your head thinking, yeah, well, where do you prune? Uh, well, the first thing is to reach up as high as you can reach, come down about 30 centimetres from that, and prune to an outward facing bud. Um, while we're talking about pruning, um, these pair of secateurs are 30 years old, and as you can see, they are pretty clean. They're nearly like the day I bought them. Um, this is a bit of a tip for all of you out there. If you've got secateurs that are dirty old black secateurs that have never been cleaned, can I recommend that you get them into uh, some soapy water with a scourer and get them back as clean as you possibly can because when you're pruning your fruit trees, if you've got a disease on one of your fruit trees or let's say maybe it's not fruit trees you've got, maybe it's a, a rose with black spot. When you've cut through your rose with black spot and you go to the next rose without having sprayed these with methylated spirits, you're about to transfer black spot into all the other roses or it could be curly leaf on a peach that you're about to go and transfer onto your nectarine without cleanliness, you're going to spread disease. So don't move from one plant to another without having first used a little bit of metho on, uh, on your, your uh, secateurs. And on a daily basis, when I've used secateurs, I take them into the kitchen and give them a scrub with a scourer to get that gum and, and that sap residue off because if it contains disease, I certainly don't want to be spreading it through my garage, uh, my, uh, my garden. So back to this, um, pruning to outward facing buds, you basically want to get yourself inside the tree and cut out anything that's pointing to you. So you basically want an open vase shape or wine glass shape and nothing in the centre of it. So anything pointing to you needs to be pruned out. And then you prune to outward facing buds so that they grow outward. So, and of course the height is, as I explained before, high as you can reach standing flat footed and that's for the person that is the pruner not the husband that's taller than you. <laughs> if you, you're the one that's pruning and you're a foot shorter or two foot shorter than the husband and you're the one pruning, make sure it's for you that you prune. So, um, all sorts of trees can be espaled and here is a apricot and as you can see probably in this you can see the timber across the top a little better. Um, lots and lots of flowers. Flowers mean fruit and uh, of course, you'd think I was gonna get a lot of fruit off that and I surely did that, that coming uh, summer. You see lateral branches on fruit trees, as I said before, produce fruit flowers and uh, very little on fruit trees on vertical growth 
uh, does. So making it all lateral uh, means that you're going to increase your yields. The beauty too also is that when you're using um, this method, you've got a great area underneath your trees to be able to grow and grow companion plants. One of the companions that I use particularly for apples is garlic. Whilst that doesn't go well on the plate together, to coin my phrase, what goes well on the plate together goes well in the ground together, but garlic actually helps keep the codling moth away. That's that little worm that eats its way into your apples and eats its way out when they're ripe. Um, the garlic, if you plant that around your apple trees, you'll find that uh, the sulphur keeps those, those, uh, those coddling moth larvae away, which is uh, fantastic. Um, by the way, there is a number of varieties of uh, ways in which you can train those. They don't necessarily have to be uh, formal espaliers like that. That's a formal espalier. Um, sometimes they'll put them in candelabra type shapes. You know, they, they look quite decorative. Um, here's one that's a plum tree. Uh, this person trying to plum tree a bit haphazardly, but uh, it's certainly a, a, a masterpiece, this one, that's a, but certainly it, it produces quite a lot of fruit because of the lateral branches that, uh, that they've used. So you don't necessarily have to train it in any way, shape or form. If you were to try and train some citrus trees, citrus trees don't have that habit of growth where um, you, know, you can train them out in a formal shape. Um, they basically get pinned one over the other so that they, they basically become a, a nice green wall of leaves um, and particularly if you multi-graft them and I've done that at home I've got um, quite a few different varieties of citrus uh, on, on the one tree I've got a mandarin, an orange, a yuzu lemon, a kumquat, um, a tangerine and a Tahitian lime I believe all on the one tree which is a great way of being able to utilise space, as you can imagine, because I don't have the room, given the size of my block of land, to plant a tree of each one of those. Um, so what I've done is I've utilised the space of the one tree to increase the different types of varieties that I have. Um, and for instance, if a kaffir lime, if you're a cook, um, you only use a few kaffir lime leaves. So it makes sense to only have a small branch of that on your lemon tree rather than have the room to have a whole tree or a pot for that matter. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's just a great way of being able to utilise space wisely and, um, and it's very easy. So with citrus, anything that won't play the game and won't be bent and, and clipped to your frame and it is persistently sticking out or sticking toward the fence, cut them, both, cut them off and they'll, they'll, they'll shoot um, growth out to to support and cover your frame eventually. They're a very easy thing to do. Um, I, alluded, I alluded to before the fact that um, fruit trees are on dwarfing rootstocks and this is um, a fruit tree in my front yard. In fact, that's my front door there on the, on the porch. Um, and as you can see, uh, I'm standing on the footpath to have taken this shot. So my front yard is set by certainly no means a big big uh, front yard. That's a pumpkin and there's some thyme growing in front but you can see how high this tree is. Now that tree is now seven years old. That's as big as it gets um, and that's what I mean by dwarfing rootstocks. They only get to about 2.1 metres high. About the top of a door frame basically is about as high as you want these fruit trees. Now there are some people that want fruit trees for a variety of different reasons and some of those might be a dual purpose. They might like to have a shade tree. But you've got to make up your mind as to um, what it is you're going to utilise the tree for so that if you're going to get fruit from it um, and, and it needs to be netted so that you don't get possums and birds and whatever else trying to knock off your fruit, the, the better. Um, and as you can see, I've used some star pickets, um, some conduit over the top and I've pulled the, uh, the netting over the top and I've pinned it into the ground with, uh, with some tent pegs to keep it uh, away from birds. Now, that's got a lot of fruit on it, hasn't it? Um, but it actually had much more fruit on it and this is one of the lessons that I've learned over the years that you can't leave all the fruit on your tree, you've got to thin your fruit tree. That's that tree and you can see all the bunches of fruit. So what I do, I look at these when they get to about little fingernail size and I'll pick the two biggest 
and with a pair of sharp secateurs, I'll snip the rest off. And I'll move down four fingers to the next group, and I'll pick two of the biggest fruit, and I'll snip the rest off. And I'll do that over the whole of the tree. And eventually what happens is, as you saw in this, this photo, these, these pieces of fruit are now nearly touching one another. So how I thought I was going to get more fruit by leaving it all on is, is silly. And in fact, particularly when you think about peaches and nectarines and the like, what happens is, if you leave all of that fruit on there, what happens is that there's not enough room. And as they grow and expand and they compete with one another, they push the fruit from the tree and you get a lot of fruit drop. Uh, the other thing that happens is that it harbours areas where you get undue mildew build up, moisture build up, and they, the fruit can sometimes get brown rot and develops uh, throughout the tree. And once you get brown rot in a tree, it goes right through the whole thing. Uh, or it's a, a harboured area for insects where you can't see very well until you go to pick the fruit and realise that insects have been able to get to it before you have. So if you can keep them um, thinned out and, and you know, you, you're likely to get much more fruit. If you think about peaches and nectarines, stone fruit, um, the stone in a peach, a peach that's um, tennis ball size versus golf ball size is the same size no matter what size the, the fruit is. So, you know, when you, you're picking a, a tennis ball size peach, you've got much more flesh around the outside of the stone than you have the small amount of flesh that is around something that's only golf ball size. Now, um, the problem with the smaller fruit is that it doesn't develop properly. It doesn't get the, the, uh, the sugar, the flavonoids, the flavour that is built into the fruit, and it certainly doesn't get anywhere near the juice that it normally would do. And I can assure you, when I pick my peaches that are tennis ball size, when you bite into them, you better be over the sink because you're going to get wet. They're extremely juicy. They're delicious. So there's that, that frame in there. Um, and there's those hedges I was talking about. That's a rosemary hedge and that's a lavender hedge. And there's another apple that I haven't netted at that stage, but uh, there's a bit of the front yard. There's some of the apples that I dropped off that tree. So, and you don't necessarily need to throw those out. I've come to realise you can make a little bit of an apple jelly cooked down with a bit of sugar. It's, uh, they, they come up pretty well. So, nothing lost. There's an apple that I pointed out to that I hadn't netted on the corner of uh, my front garden there. And this is just simply to show you that they don't need to be espaliered apple trees to be multi-grafted. This is one of those ones that's an open wine glass shape that I've put um, multiple varieties on. And uh, by the way, there's a Christmas apple, which means that you get that in December, which is one of the earliest apples I've seen um, fruit in Victoria. Another one to note is a Bramley seedling, which would you believe Granny Smith apples aren't green if I told you that? Um, Granny Smith apples, when they're ripe, slightly yellow. And um, here's another bit of a tip that you can save in your memory banks if you can remember it. Um, when you go to pick a piece of fruit, if you give it half a twist on the, on, the, on the tree, if it comes off in your hand, it's ripe. If it doesn't, the tendency is to leave it on until it is, it comes off easily with that half twist. Uh, and when you do that with a Granny Smith apple, they are slightly yellow. When they are not tart, they're quite sweet. I think that we've been um, hoodwinked by the supermarkets. They get longevity on the shelves. Most of our food and fruit these days is, uh, is grown for shelves and not for us, unfortunately. Um, hedges that I was pointing out before are another great habitat for um, things like birds particularly. I get silver eyes and small fairy wrens where I live. Um, that, 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 a habit, uh, that are making a habitat out of these hedges, which is fantastic, so that when I get predatory moths and so forth, these birds will fly out and pick up these, these uh, pest insects. But um, th there are some other things that you can do in your own backyard, and uh, they're fairly easy things to do. Uh, the insect hotels. So habitat creation, this is an insect hotel. A lot of people call it bee hotels, but uh, I don't really see, um, I've not seen so far any bees take mine up as a resident. But small flying insects like small wasps and so forth make this home. Now, people get frightened when I use the term wasps. 
these wasps are not like the European wasps. You won't even see them, but they are fantastic little insects to have in your garden. Things like uh, lacewing insects, um, ladybird beetles, and all sorts of range of insects. If you've got places like this um, within your garden, hanging out of your trees or on your fences, um, face them northeast. That way, they get uh, good morning sun and sheltered from the hot afternoon sun. And when they're resident in your backyard, when you've got a pest um, or a pollination um, opportunity, you'll find that these predatory insects will come out and help you out in your garden. So it's all about building this little ecosystem um, to get a great sustainable edible garden. And uh, all of these little 1% things that you'll do will, will actually help build this wonderful ecosystem in your, your backyard that will potentially look after itself. Um, one of the things that I've come to learn over the many years that I've been uh, doing this, and in fact I've been doing it for over 40 years, um, edible gardening, and I started out life in Sunbury um, on a five-sided block that uh, backed onto a creek, and uh, it was a nightmare, this, this block that I had, and my wife uh, way back then didn't want to have a vegetable garden, which sort of devastated me as a young horticulturalist, that's the very thing that I wanted to do most of all was to be able to grow food. So the edible garden was born. I had to find innovative ways of being able to fit in edible plants and uh, that, that's exactly what I did. But the one thing that I didn't bargain on was uh, just how good raising chickens could be. Um, and I've discovered that chickens are the cornerstone of most gardens and uh, um, councils will allow you to have X amount of chickens. Um, I know in Wyndham is six, and I think in Melton is ten. Uh, but make sure you check your local bylaws to find out uh, uh, the the amount that you're allowed. But um, I can assure you that they are fantastic to have in your backyard. I actually put, like I said to you um, in the part one of, of this series, and I'll, I'll reiterate it today that um, uh, for anything to have a, a, a position in my garden, it has to have a use or give me back something. And chickens absolutely give you so much, it's, it's ridiculous. And I, I put them to work, and uh, this is a little rabbit hutch that has no floor in it. And, uh, you know, to get them into mowing the lawn. So a little bit of water in the, in the end. Um, this here has got a little bit of straw in it so that if she decides to, while I'm out at work, uh, to lay an egg, she can. And uh, you simply move this along day by day and uh, she pretty well keeps that, that area of the lawn um, mowed. But they're uh, better still. <coughs> A lot of people tell me that they don't have time to turn over soil or um, you know, attend the, the gardens and so forth. Put, the, put these guys to work. Um, I, I sometimes get busy, life gets in the way sometimes and I don't get time to pull out weeds and there might be some spent vegetables that I haven't had time to pull out. So I'll put the little, we call this a, ch a chicken tractor um, because it's movable and we put a chicken in it and um, same thing, put a little bit of water in there um, for it to, to, to be able to get a hold of during the day and a little bit of uh, straw in the end so egg laying is not an issue. And while you're at work, these guys are scratching around through the soil uh, eating up the spent plants, pulling out the weeds, eating the weeds, and when you get home they've left your breakfast. And all you've got to do is basically move that along the width of the thing, change the chook if you've got more chooks, don't just put the same chook in there day by day, they are flock animals after all. Um, or you can put a bigger one on that's the width of the bed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very easy thing to do, but these guys certainly do give you back heaps. Now. All of my weeds go over the fence to the chickens. Uh, all of our food scraps go to the chickens. Some goes to the compost, but the majority go to the chickens. Um, the straw that I put in there that collects their manure go into the compost. And of course that gets um, well used throughout top dressing the garden beds um, along with the sugarcane mulch. Um, they are a wonderful thing. And in fact, um, when I've had some insect problems I'll pull one chicken out, particularly if it's been a cabbage moth uh, with those green caterpillars. And uh, you, you can only do this one with one chook. 
Um, and I, I don't let my chooks run free in my garden. I have a dedicated area that they run down the blind side of the house. I never have to worry about mowing it, so I don't leave them out in my garden because that's my food, not theirs. I do grow some stuff for them, but um, if you let them out into your garden, that's like the Garden of Eden to, to, to them, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll eat you out of house and home in no time flat if you've got you know, anywhere between six and ten chooks, believe me. So one at a time is a great way forward. So I'll grab one chicken and I'll take them to the problem with the... Um, the broccoli or cabbage that's got the white butterfly uh, caterpillar on it that's eating me out of house and home. And initially the chook will start and peck the leaves until I start to feed it a couple of the caterpillars. And all of a sudden I'll lift up the leaf and show the caterpillar to the chook and then the, the, the chook realises just what's going on and it will pick absolutely every last caterpillar off that broccoli. Now if you had another chook within its eye shot the minute that that chook moved, this would lose interest and it would, you, you wouldn't achieve what you set out to do. But I can assure you with one chicken and one chicken only, they are great bug catchers and, you, and, and they, will, they will delight in, in, in you doing that. So um, I highly recommend you getting involved in getting some chickens. Some of the harvests that I get, and I, I do this just so that you can understand just what can happen in a small garden. This is my harvest of garlic. Um, now garlic, like I said in the first uh, part of this series, goes in around about now, um, April, May, and it gets harvested generally in the, on the longest day or around about 22nd of December. Um, you don't necessarily have to set your, your, your date to that, but that's an indication as to when uh, that's likely to happen and uh, when the, the top of the plant starts to die over. Uh, to, to, to die off or will become limp and that's when I, I harvest and I let them sit out in the sun for a day or two to dry out and then I plait them and then I hang them up in the garage. But that'll give you an idea of um, just what can be done. And that one clove produces one bulb over time, so there you go. So I put about 250 bulbs of garlic throughout my, my garden dotted here and there. I put them out the front I've even got an apple tree in the nature strip and guess what rings the apple tree to keep the coddling moth off? You guessed it, garlic. So it's a great, uh, a great product. When it comes to being sustainable in your backyard, um, tomatoes seem to be one of those things that we, uh, we, we tend to do very well in Australia, albeit that, the, of course, most of what we grow here as food plants are not from Australia, they're from everywhere else. But the thing I... I I want to point out about um, tomatoes is making sure that in the height of the season that you pick that great big tomato off your bush, don't eat that one. Cut that one open and scrape the seeds out of it because you get to build the genetics in these things. They become acclimatised to your soil pH, your rainfall, um, all sorts of things, your, your, your climate, um, your ecosystem that's going on and Year on year, if you keep saving the, the seeds out of the big tomatoes that you're growing, you'll actually get bigger, better, tastier yields year after year. Whereas if you're just simply going down the supermarket or the supermarket to buy seeds or the nursery to buy seedlings, you're not getting to build any genetics whatsoever. So uh, worth doing, saving seeds. This is another great little... Uh, invention, it's called a wicking bed. It's a self-watering pot, um, or in this instance a crate. This is a repurposed fruit crate that the fruiterers use, and it's got a bladder in the uh, inside it, and uh, about halfway up is filled with uh, 20 mil in diameter volcanic scoria rock, and uh, it has a, a pipe put in the corner of it, that blue pipe there, which got a cap on the top of it, um, to be able to poke the hose down and fill that, that, uh, that rock area, which becomes a reservoir. Across the top of the rock, um, it has a geotextile fabric, or you could use something like a, a couple of layers of, of uh, 50 mil shade cloth, and uh, that stops the soil from penetrating down through the rock. Um, and the soil layer, you, you want to make sure it's only ever 300 millimetres deep. 
Um, and, 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 and what happens is it causes this wicking effect where once you've filled up the reservoir on the bottom, the soil becomes slightly saturated and it will wick up the water when the roots start to penetrate down in the soil. And uh, all you need to do is to fill this once every fortnight to a month. Uh, just keep an eye on it. And there is an overflow put in at the same height as the stone in the soil level so that when the reservoir is full, uh, you know it's full when it runs out of the overflow pipe. Um, these are fantastic for people that are a little bit forgetful or um, have got limited amount of space. Um, I, I reckon they're fantastic and in fact I've done some, I've got a wicking bit at home that uh, when I plant some of the plants out of the punnet into my garden and the same plants into the wicking bed, the ones in the wicking bed outgrow mine by two or three times and I'm a qualified horticulturalist. So it'll give you an idea as to um, just what happens when you're able to, f to, to feed plants water that they need when they need it rather than when we think they need it. Uh, it's remarkable. This is a photo of a, uh, an installation I did for um, a, a treatment plant out in Altona and this is facing north. So over the summer months, the year we had all those 45 degree days on end, um, these guys copped a, a, a hammering and uh, on my way back from holidays I decided to call past and just check in and see how they went and uh, I walked around the corner and to my amazement all of these plants, there was no burnt leaves on any of the lettuce and so forth. Native grasses in the background had died because of the the furnace-like blast that they must have gotten yet these guys because that they were in touch with that water reservoir had survived. Not only had they survived, they actually thrived. So on those real hot windy days where you're struggling to keep anything alive, these guys here are bolt upright and it's remarkable to see. So um, I've got a section of that in my book, detailed. So, uh, but look it up. There's there's plenty of info on the uh, the internet about wicking beds. You can do them in all sorts of variety of things. Um, some of the subtropical type plants that uh, we can grow here in Victoria um, need to be positioned correctly. And this is a tamarillo, a tree tomato, um, and. It, it, you can use it both savoury and sweet, and I, I reckon they're delicious. And I, to be honest, I, I, I'd never tried them until someone suggested that um, if you find the right spot, they'll grow well. And I, the, the idea behind anything that's sort of subtropical, you need to have facing a warm brick wall, as you can see this is. It's facing north or northwest. Um, because the warm brick wall will warm up during the course of the day. And as the sun sets, it will radiate that warmth out over the plants that are planted by it to keep the overnight low temperatures up higher so that it's okay. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And I have to say that, uh, you know, we don't eat in season much these days, unfortunately. We're able to walk into a supermarket and buy um, whatever we like, when we like. And there's a bit of a consequence to be had for that. You know, we should be eating things in season. And it's one of the reasons why I planted this, because they call it a tree tomato. And I love tomatoes, but I know their health benefits are good for your heart. Um, so when you're eating tomatoes at the height of their season, you're feeding your heart exactly what you need. Um, so in the winter months, what can I feed my body to give it what it needs in terms of the heart scenario? So this was a natural uh, alternative to uh, tomatoes, because of course tomatoes won't grow here in winter. Um, it's funny that a lot of fruit and veg looks a bit like the body parts that it's good for. Um, you know, beans, for instance, are very good for kidneys. And if you look at the shape of them, that's what they, they, uh, they look like. Um, carrots, when you snap those and look at them, they've got lines um, and, and it's central rings that form like an eye, an iris. So um, obviously beta carotene is full of uh, goodness for your eyes. Um, celery, long and slender snaps like a bone, full of calcium. Um, bananas, long and strap-like, muscle-like, full of um, potassium, stops cramping. You know, it, it's remarkable. Food is medicine. And um, I think if you can learn how to grow your own food in your own gardens, 
um, particularly uh, in light of uh, some of the recent um, health events where we found that you know, uh, some of these things were being, becoming very difficult to try and get in our supermarkets. But it's more to that. It's more about trying to lessen the amount of chemicals that we're ingesting and getting back some control over what you're putting in your mouth and feeding your families. And I think that if you can choose an organic way using companion planting, it's not only uh, a healthy way of living, but it's certainly a sustainable way of living. And uh, you'll find that you'll get great fun and delight from, um, from being able to walk out the backyard and harvest what you want, when you want. So I hope you enjoyed this two-part series of edible gardening. As I said before, um, I, uh, I, I run a business called Edible Gardens um, and uh, you can look me up on my website www.craigcastry.com.au and uh, send me a message. Don't forget to check out part one of the Edible Garden Sustainable series and other videos that we've recorded on the Melton City Council Learning Directory website and Facebook page. Bye for now.